Uh, thanks, Nikita. I'm Aziz Mohaisen at the University of Central Florida, and this is uh, joint work uh, with uh, Mohammed Abu Hamad, Tamar Abu Hamad, and uh, Dehan Young from uh, Inha University in uh, South Korea. So uh, those are uh, basically the outlines of um, my talk. So it's going to be an introduction, state of the art and shortcomings, our system, experiments, uh, a lot of experiments, and then conclusion and future work. And so uh, in a nutshell, uh, what we are doing here is basically code authorship identification. And by identification, we mean uh, assigning uh, labels to code uh, source codes based on some uh, uh, you know, intrinsic style metric features. And that in itself can be a good thing and a bad thing. I think if you attended uh, yesterday's uh, sessions uh, of WBiz, maybe you've heard about like the risk uh, of the anonymization of programmers as a privacy issue. And also, uh, this can be used as a, a good thing, as a desirable feature. Uh, basically, in uh, software forensics, the good example for this is the dispute between Oracle and um, uh, Google. Uh, code authorship identification is challenging uh, in of itself, as the programming style uh, uh, of programmers uh, basically continuously evolves over time. Uh, it is language dependent, and it is a brunt of discussion. Now, uh, that in mind, there has been a lot of work on uh, this problem, uh, starting from 1993, um, uh, the work, the similar work of uh, Gene Spafford, uh, where uh, he has shown that you can actually um, um, use some similar features of code to identify uh, code authors. And since then, there has been a lot of work. And so this work has been uh, variant in the sense that um, uh, it had a large, like, you know, var variable number of uh, authors, users that can be identified from uh, codes over multiple languages with uh, different accuracies and uh, various uh, um, uh, classification techniques used uh, for automation processes. However, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, up until today, the number of authors that has been uh, addressed with those techniques is uh, quite limited, up to a thousand. Uh, the language uh, uh, analyzed, uh, although many languages, uh, the uh, way that uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, identification has been done is that you would learn from uh, the same language and identify in the same language as well. And the accuracy, while it's great, uh, is still, you know, sometimes uh, it is uh, uh, not operationally relevant or acceptable. Uh, finally, uh, the work uh, that has uh, been done in the past uh, has been basically uh, uh, using some uh, feature engineering that is uh, known to be very labor intensive. In this work, we try to address all of those issues uh, by uh, scaling up, uh, addressing multiple languages uh, through training in one language and finding another language, and uh, achieving a high accuracy uh, rate, uh, comparable to the uh, state of the art even uh, when the uh, number of authors is quite larger. And then uh, finally, for classification, we try to get uh, rid uh, of uh, the um, uh, um, engineering uh, process altogether of features. So again, uh, to recap the shortcomings of the prior work, uh, they are basically uh, language dependent, uh, they are limited in, scal in scalability, and they are in a sense labor intensive uh, for engineering uh, features. Uh, the features themselves uh, have uh, been uh, known to be sparse and uh, the relevance uh, uh, is quite uh, limited in many cases. And uh, other uh, challenges, uh, generally speaking, uh, include uh, that perhaps prevented large scale work in the past is that the uh, prior work had limited access to code samples of uh, programmers and uh, did not understand the temporal effects of uh, programming styles over time and did not look into uh, obfuscation, which as well we address in this work. So our contribution is a large scale uh, language oblivious, obfuscation resi resistant, resilient, uh, deep learning based uh, code authorship identification uh, system. And our system uh, actually uh, achieve high identification accuracy uh, by uh, tackling the problem of data representation, code authorship attributes, and in simple classification. So our uh, system, in a nutshell, uh, has three phases. Uh, that is pre-processing, representation through learning, and uh, classification. And so in the first phase, we start with the uh, code files per uh, a given author to build uh, some uh, row uh, representative high-level features using uh, the TF-IDF uh, representation. And that's what we call data preprocessing uh, phase. I will talk about that in more details in the next slide. Then uh, come our representation through learning uh, phase, uh, which consists of uh, two uh, uh, phases. The first phase is uh, through uh, three layers of RNN. Uh, that utilize LSDM and GRU, uh, 
that would extract features uh, from uh, the TF-IDF. And then the uh, efficient representation of the features come through uh, fully connected uh, three la layers. Fully connected here means that every uh, a neuron uh, among the last three uh, layers is connected to every uh, a neuron uh, subsequent to it. And then uh, finally, as we get uh, the output of uh, this uh, efficient representation of the features that are uh, driven from the TF-IDF, uh, they're going to be y0 up to yn. Then we feed that into some ensemble classifier. The ensemble classifier will give us a label of uh, the uh, code author. So uh, for the B-Rusting, we use TF-IDF, which is a very uh, um, uh, it's an accepted uh, standard technique. And uh, for the initialization, um, the code files are basically uh, represented by the TF-IDF of words using unigram, uh, biogram, and trigram. So basically, uh, what we do is that we uh, create a subvector for the unigrams, biograms, trigrams, and just concatenate them. And then for uh, given that uh, we will have a bloated uh, um, um, space of uh, the features for the unigram, biogram, and trigram, we try to optimize uh, our system uh, by selecting the uh, top k uh, terms that can uh, reduce dimensionality and uh, maximize the accuracy. And uh, for that, um, we not really want to look into all the uh, space of the state uh, that we can look uh, into. So if you look on the x-axis, we have the number of uh, features selected. So just by going um, starting from 1,000 to 4,500 uh, increments, uh, we just pick uh, a rough number that would maximize uh, uh, the accuracy. And this is not necessarily like the maximal as an optimal, uh, but you know, uh, a lot uh, like uh, a good accuracy that is reasonable for us. And so that is for pre-processing. For the deep learning representation, TF-IDF representations are fed into the deep learning uh, structure, one sequence per uh, code sample uh, uh, to generate uh, the quality representations. And uh, here's what we mean by quality representations. If you look at uh, this figure on the uh, x-axis, you have the BCA, BCA component. Uh, and uh, two components and their uh, correlations. So we have, uh, as you see through the visualization for five different authors, we see that uh, the BC components are uh, quite uh, uh, confused. And so uh, upon uh, uh, applying our deep representation, uh, uh, then uh, those uh, like you know the BC, the more significant components and the BC analysis uh, are going to be uh, somewhat uh, uh, separated, uh, which tells that those are uh, good quality components for identification of uh, the different uh, classes, that is authors uh, one to five. Then comes the classification stage, and the classification stage here is a very simple uh, RFC uh, classifier for which uh, we use an ensemble of 300 uh, trees. Uh, 300 is basically uh, uh, used uh, as it provides uh, the best trade-off between the model construction time and the accuracy. And again, we use a standard k-fold cross-validation uh, to evaluate how the model generalizes to independent datasets. So uh, I guess a, a great part of this talk is going to be about the experiments to convince you that this actually works, addressing the initial premises of the work uh, by being scalable, uh, by uh, uh, identifying with limited number of samples, uh, by uh, providing programmers' styles evolution over time, uh, and capturing it uh, by doing attribution beyond language specifics using mixed languages, uh, addressing obfuscation, as well as uh, running in the wild uh, on GitHub samples. And for uh, our experiments, we use the Google Code Jams data sets in their entirety from uh, 2008 to 2016, the time of writing this paper, and um, uh, uh, about 2,000 uh, public uh, repos of, of GitHub for in the wild testing. So uh, again, uh, those numbers, uh, just keep in mind, as those are going to be referenced in the next uh, few slides as experiments one through experiment six, experiment one for scalability, experiment six for in the wild experimentation. And so for the uh, first experiment, where we have large scale authorship identification, we use the uh, Google uh, Code Jam uh, that I said from 2008 to 2016 for uh, four languages. That is uh, C++, Java, Python, and C. And uh, here is the representation of the essay. So we have um, uh, for um, uh, C++, the largest uh, of all languages, we have about 6,600 uh, uh, um, uh, authors, which have nine uh, files. On, av on average, uh, each of those uh, files has uh, 71 uh, uh, lines of code, and so forth for the other languages. And the objective here is to find out what is the accuracy of uh, the, the system uh, as we scale the number of, uh, the number of authors. 
And so if you uh, look at the uh, uh, different uh, snippets for the uh, different results, on the x-axis we have number of authors, on the y-axis we have the accuracy for different programming languages, uh, C++, <laughs> Java, Python, and uh, C. And um, what we have uh, seen here is that the accuracy is always uh, greater than 92%, uh, percent, even for uh, and defining the largest among uh, those programmers. And for all languages, accuracy is greater than 98.5% uh, uh, um, for uh, about 150 uh, programmers, which is the middle of the uh, bulk of the uh, uh, experiments done in the literature. We also noticed that LSTM and GRU are capable of learning uh, deep code authorship attributes that enable uh, such large uh, scale identification. If you're not convinced by the earlier presentation of the features, uh, this experiment should be enough uh, of uh, convincing material. Then uh, we uh, uh, look into the effect of uh, code samples per author, the number of code samples per author. Uh, as we have seen uh, in the previous uh, experiment, uh, nine files are sufficient, and this like nine files per author is basically the number that has been used in the literature. But can we do less? Can we just like you know have a small, smaller number of uh, files per author and still identify authors with uh, a similar accuracy or um, reasonable accuracy? And so again, for this, we use uh, the same data set uh, of C++, Java, Python, and C. And so here are the results. With seven files, there is no really degradation in the accuracy. Again, uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, on the uh, x-axis, we have the number of authors. On the y-axis, we have the accuracy for the similar programming languages. And this is for the uh, seven files uh, across all the languages. And so with this, with uh, seven uh, files, there is no accuracy degradation. 92% uh, uh, of accuracy is uh, for the 9,000 uh, programmers, and uh, be, um, which proves the case that you can go with, uh, with lifts and seven is sufficient. We can even go uh, uh, lower uh, by um, you know, trying even five, seven, and nine files. And uh, here, what we have uh, found by selecting 1,000 programmers uh, uh, that have uh, the different sizes of files for different programming languages, is that with five files, the system still uh, manages to uh, provide higher, a high accuracy of 92% uh, percent at least. Moving forward, we look into the temporal effect uh, on uh, uh, the identification capabilities of the system. That is to say, uh, do temporal effects influence the accuracy of uh, authorship identification? And by temporal effect here, we mean the change in style over time. If the temporal effect exists, can a model uh, trained on data from one year be uh, used to accurately predict uh, another year? And so uh, for uh, our experiments, uh, again, using the similar data set uh, for the year to sound, uh, uh, 14 and 15, uh, what we have found is that uh, um, we uh, were able to achieve an accuracy uh, per year that is uh, higher than the aggregate accuracy, which indicates that there might be uh, an effect, a temporal effect in uh, any place. So 95%, 95.23% uh, uh, 95 uh, for the 2200 uh, uh, C++ programmers, uh, as well as 95.17% uh, for the uh, 1744 uh, C++ programmers uh, for the years 2015 and 2016 uh, that I said respectively, respectively on the best slide. Similar accuracy also is achieved for Java and Python. The effect is not really significant, uh, but highlight that there is some change. Uh, uh, of year over year, which lead us to uh, uh, do the testing over, uh, like, you know, do the training on one year and testing on another year to see if we can achieve uh, their accuracy. And so here are the results. Uh, the accuracy of identification for programmers who solve uh, seven uh, problems in the year 2014 and 20 to 2016 uh, over time, the identification model, uh, models were trained uh, for data from 2014 and tested on data from 2015 and 2016. And uh, the results here uh, shown uh, for the C++, uh, Python, and Java show that the approach is resilient to the temporal changes. So uh, moving forward, we look into identification with mixed languages. And here, uh, what we mean by mixed languages is that you want to build the model uh, on uh, perhaps uh, one language to another language, or maybe uh, uh, build a model on a mix of codes from different languages for the same author, and then uh, do the identification on uh, codes from other language. And so for that, we do, two, we do both. We do uh, identification with mixed languages. Uh, that is, uh, we start with the data set across all years for programmers with multiple languages. And so again, we use non files And the authors across the years that have C++ and C were uh, about 1900, C++ and Java about 900, 850, and then C++ and Python about 620. And that question again to answer, is it possible to identify programmers writing in multiple languages? And so uh, the answer is yes. So 
if we use the uh, identification with mixed languages, meaning that like, you know, start with uh, your training set that is C++ and C, uh, or Java and C++ or Python and C++, you'll be able to identify a code that is either C++ or C uh, uh, using a model that is trained with such data with 96% accuracy, 97% accuracy with Java and C++, and then 97.5% accuracy with Python and C++ for a large number of programmers. Now, also we do this with, uh, with a model that is trained with one language and tested another language. We start with C++ as our training, uh, tra training data, and then uh, test the identification uh, for uh, codes that are generated using C, and we were able to achieve 90.29% uh, of accuracy for uh, 224 programmers. Uh, the fifth experiment is to look into identification of SCED uh, uh, codes. Uh, and uh, for that, we use two of the shelf of the scaters, uh, Stunix and uh, Tigris. And uh, uh, we want to see, like, you know, how much of the style itself is maintained in the uh, obfuscation, uh, upon obfuscation, which is, I guess, a natural thing to think of. And so, under the assumption of knowing the obfuscation tool, so uh, we do not try, like, you know, to uh, um, look in the wild. So, if we know the obfuscation tool, then we can build a model uh, that we can uh, again test. And uh, so, if we are to look into uh, Stunix obfuscated uh, um, uh, C code, we were able to achieve a 98.9% uh, 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 of accuracy for 120 programmers and Tigris about 93.4% uh, of accuracy for 120 programmers. Here is one thing to note is that we uh, build the model with the obfuscated code and we test it on the obfuscated code. And uh, my, while this might you know, seem a little bit outrageous, uh, this is how things are done in the literature. So, uh, the uh, last three, four papers in the first table I mentioned. They also look into that as well using the same method. A better way would be like you know, uh, build your uh, model using you know the raw source code and then test it on the obfuscated code. A final experiment is to look into identification in the wild, and for that we uh, start with about two thousand public uh, repo of uh, on GitHub's. Uh, with one contributor, they are C and C++ as the primary languages. And the ground truth assumption that you have to live with here is that, uh, like, you know, one contributor, basically. And so the results here, uh, using uh, at least uh, five code files, we were able to uh, see 95% uh, accuracy for C++ repos for 147 uh, programmers and see uh, 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 and 94.38%. Uh, of accuracy for um, the uh, uh, C repos for 750 programmers, more or less. And so this actually is very promising in the sense this can actually lead some applications in the area of code uh, segment reuse, identifying uh, code segment reuse, or maybe uh, finer grained uh, uh, kind of identification at lower granularities than a, a whole file or bunch of files. Or you can also look into data uh, set authenticity as well. So in summary, uh, we look at the uh, problem of large-scale programmers' identification, exploiting uh, term frequency as an initial representation, exploiting deep learning uh, for feature representation and uh, quality uh, uh, feature extraction, and uh, exploiting ensembles for uh, actual uh, classification. Experiments uh, were used to demo the scalability and robustness of the system across multiple evaluation vectors, and the work promises uh, various directions that I would invite you uh, to look into. With this, uh, thank you very much. I'm doing this talk only uh, because the uh, lead author on this was not able to obtain the visa, and I hear that uh, um, many others were not able to obtain the visa. I'll be able to uh, answer any questions. Uh, for questions, please come up to the mic. Uh, okay, so Yang Zhang from CISPAR Germany. So I have a question. So. If I understand your approach correctly, so you have a code and then you cut you several different pieces and each piece you use TF-IDF, then you use LSTM, right? So my question is, why don't you directly use LSTM instead of the TF-IDF process? We do not really uh, break the code into multiple uh, pieces of code. What we do is that we start with like, you know, the input is going to be multiple files. And so you build your model with uh, like, you know, say a few files and then mm -hmm. test with other files. Okay, our second question. So your LSTM is also trained with author identification, yeah? With your, the author identification, your RSTM is trained. That's right. Yeah, but then this RSTM trained directly, the result is bad than compared to you take the feature out and train random forest. Or it's good or bad, so the result. It's a lot better. So if you remember, when we look into the uh, representation of the features using BCA, you see that the authors are uh, quite like the feature, the, the, the significant components in the BCA. No, no, I won't want, I want know the direct result of the RSTM result. I did not do that, but I can tell you that, like, you know, I bit on this, that the results are going to be worse, a lot worse. 
Okay, thanks. Yeah. Based on my understanding of like basic statistics. Thanks. Just a quick question. Uh, yes, please. You're using this metric of files. Right. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, why not LOC, line of code or so, some, something more understandable? I, I just don't understand. This is not my area, but I this is one of the things that... So why files? What are files? I don't, I don't understand what files are. So uh, that is a very good question, actually, which is uh, potentially like, you know, a good direction uh, moving forward, looking into finer granularity of identification, like, you know, identifying based on a blocks of code. A block of code is a unit of code that is better than a no, file. No, no, I was referring but what is a file? What is a file basically is uh, m more related to uh, the, uh, the uh, code jam, Google code jam. So every uh, uh, problem is being solved with, uh, with a, a solution. Uh, that is represented as a file. And so that is what is a file. It's like, you know, a bunch of lines of code uh, that are named. Uh, unless I misunderstood. Yeah. At some point, you're basically saying uh, with just seven files, you could get some certain accuracy and so on. I'm not exactly sure what that those files are. Are they just two header files? No, uh, the actual actual problem uh, solutions. So those are like... Uh, um, okay, then I'm... Just code, I code, 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 so code how much files. input do you need to start to train? That's So uh, that was in one of, one of the slides. The average number of code, uh, num number of lines of code, uh, okay, their so file was mentioned in the slides. 70 to 50, 50 to 70 uh, lines of code. I, just a quick question. Uh, when you train your network, what is your loss function? That is a question I can't answer. Professor Young, do you remember it? Yeah. Not on top of my head. But I, I'll be able to, I'll be happy to send it to you. Yeah, sure. I just had a quick question. What, do you have any sense of the variability in results? Did you segment the, the data sets you use to see if using different portions of the data set produce variability in the results? The K, the, the, but that's the only thing that we did. So we did uh, uh, K fold cross validations and with, where K is 10. But is the, that is the only thing that we uh, did. We not, uh, well, I think we did a lot more. So let me uh, paraphrase the question and answer it. So the question is that did we try to test our approach ac uh, across, like, you know, uh, by dividing data or by, right. by looking into different devices that see its robustness? Well, and also or just variability. the variability of the results uh, with, seg with so, portions of the data set. So, so uh, we, we did a K, K folder cross validation, which just like, you know, looks into the generalization of the data. Second, we looked into uh, the variability, the variable number of authors, and that affected the uh, performance. And then we looked into uh, the number of files of code, and that also affects the uh, uh, performance as well. And so the larger, the larger the number of files, the better the accuracy. The larger the number of authors, the worse the accuracy, and so forth. All right. Uh, I think that's uh, all the time we have right now. So let's thank Aziz. Thank you.